After I served five years as a president of Baptist World Alliance, from Birmingham, England, I went to London, got on the uh, British Airway. Soon as I sat down, a young flight attendant lady said, are you Chinese? You never ask Korean, are you Chinese? <laughs> I said, no. She said, are you Japanese? You never, never ask Korean, are you Japanese? It's like asking German person, say, are you Frenchman? I said, no. She said, what are you? I said, I'm Korean. She said, I cannot tell the difference between Korean and Japanese and Chinese. I told her I have a hard time telling white people whether they are French or whether German, whether they are Netherlands or Denmark. They all look same to me also. <laughs> But I did tell her there's a way you could tell difference between Chinese, Japanese, Korean. She said, oh, how can you tell difference? I said, that's easy. When you see an Asian on the street, if you think he's a lot of money, wealthy looking, they're Chinese. <laughs> now, they are coming to Korea. All the Chinese coming to Korea buy all the cosmetics in the department store. They almost bought out Jeju Island, our friend from Jeju Island, they're buying everything, all the real estate. So if you see an Asian on the street, if you think he's wealthy looking, he's Chinese. She said, oh. When you look at the Asian on the street, if you think he's got a lot of smart, a lot of intelligence, he's Japanese. She said, oh. But when you look at the Asian on the street, if you think he's good looking, he's handsome, he's Korean. <laughs> What a privilege it is to visit Wheaton College. <laughs> My youngest son got his master's here in the communication, and his wife also got master's here in education. And I consider it's a real privilege to be here. As you understand, the students of this Wheaton College have been influencing the world for Christ and his kingdom. Billy Graham, Sam Moffat, Hester, and Elliot. All these people made tremendous impact around the world. Jonathan Blencher, the first president of this great institution, was able to not only administrator, known widely as a staunch abolitionist and a crusader for social reform. Through his desire and many people's prayers, to commit Wheaton College a combination of intellectual growth and a Christian faith, Wheaton College has grown and progressed to what it is today. More than a century, God has blessed Wheaton College to be one of the greatest Christian institutions in our world today, and you ought to be very proud to be a student of Wheaton College. Nobody responding. <laughs> Wheaton College was ranked the 33rd in a list of the 106 smartest liberal art colleges in America by Business Insiders. I ranked first. <laughs> I may be a little biased. I admire your president. We had a wonderful time when he visited Korea past January. He's a model workman to follow as a student of this great institution. Second Timothy chapter 215, we find the study to show thyself approve unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth. Workmen must have compassion for the souls and for the world. Matthew 14, 14 said, When Jesus went forth and saw great multitudes, and he was moved with the compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. We are living in a competitive world, a busy world, a merciless world, unfriendly world, poor world. Some countries a very rich world. 
Wilberforce said, I dare not marry because the future is too unsettled. William Penn said, there is scarcely anything around us but ruin and despair. Benjamin Disrael said, industry, commerce, and agriculture, there is no hope. Lord Grey said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Don't let the world's wealth and the pleasure distract you from the foremost concern, which is compassion for the lost world. Wealth may not be appealing to you, but let me share just a few things. I understand every day in America, 800 million people drink Coke every day. At one time, 63% of the world's automobiles driven by the American people. I changed my mind since I landed in Chicago. I think it's 99% of the world's automobiles driven by the American people. <laughs> At one time, 78% of the world's insurance is purchased by the American people. At one time, 50% of the world's wealth was owned and controlled by American people. Now the German and Japanese people tried to help you out. <laughs> Annually, Americans spend $780 million on anti-acid, $960 million worth of deodorant. That's why you smell so good. <laughs> Yet American population consists only 5% of the world's population. No other nation has been blessed by God Almighty as the people of the United States of America. Believe me, you've been blessed, and don't you ever take it for granted. A South American president was right when he said, Roger Babson, the difference between the North and South, South America was that South America was settled by man seeking gold. The North America was settled by man seeking God. Thank God your nation is still one nation under God. Somehow you have survived the aggressive war and tragic division of the past decade. Your brightest and the best have given their lives in war on foreign soil. They have not died in vain. Your mountains and parks and the natural scenic spots are unparalleled by any around the world. If they brag about the beauties of the coast of the Mediterranean, you can boast about Atlantic and the Pacific and the Gulf Coast. When they speak of Dundee, the river of Europe, you could tell them about the mighty Mississippi, the Ohio, and the Colorado rivers. If they brag about the mountains of Switzerland, you can point to the rugged Rockies and the Alleghenies and the Smoky Mountains. 1492, America was discovered by Columbus. At least the history tells us that. But I have a friend, an ambassador in the United Nations, he said, Columbus didn't discover America first. I said, who discovered America first? He said, the group of Chinese people came to San Francisco. They looked over the mountains, and they decided there's not much laundry business. They went back, and later, 1492, Columbus come discover this great nation. In 1620, Peregrine Fathers landed, searched for the religious freedom. Wherever the American flag, the stars and stripes, have flown round the world, the symbol of freedom, peace, and liberty. And I find in American money inscribed in God we trust. Because of this and high holy motive, God bless America more than any other nation on the face of the earth, and believe me, you've been blessed. Yet in spite of all the blessings of God in America today, there's a sin on every hand. 90% of New York City's young people never darken any church. Every 22 seconds, one major crime is committed in this country. In spite of all the blessings of God in America, every 24 minutes, one murder is committed. At least one quarter of high school, one quarter of million high school girls leave a high school desk each year to the maternity war. California spent estimated $210 million on cocaine consumption on every week. This is the nation that have nothing but the blessings of God. Yet in spite of all the blessings of God in America today, there's a sin on every hand. Wake up, America, before it is too late. You must return to the faith of your founding fathers. 
You must think the unthinkable, hear the inaudible, and see the unseeable. The Bible tell us, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. In book of Psalm 917, we read, the wicked shall turn into hell and all the nations that forget God. America is no exception. Korea is no exception. If she forgets God, she'll have to face the wrath and judgment of God like any other nation in the days gone by. But I have a consolation for you. Bible tells us, if God be for us, who can be against us? The only thing that will overcome such a world is a compassion. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 said, the love of Christ constrains us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but everlasting love. God's love has penetrated every heart, those who claim Christ as their Lord and Savior. I believe we in teachers, not only academics, but I believe they teach the central theme of Christ coming to the world is the love of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 said, but commanded his love toward us in that while we were, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Someone said faith makes it possible, but love makes it easier. It has been said that love is oil that lubricates our spiritual being. Love is the life that rejuvenates. Love is the affection to captivate. The love is power to consecrate. Love is the spring to animate. Love is the tonic to stimulate. And the love is the grace to elevate. The greatest thing in the world is love. And I believe every classroom in this great institution the faculty member would teach and instill the student's life, love of Jesus Christ, far greater than any subject that we learn. But I don't want to slide your subject because every good student must make all A's. <laughs> and I hope faculty member will understand if they, you know, Make a B plus, just give him an A minus. <laughs> Workman must have a secret power of prayer. And I'm so happy Wheaton College has taken prayer life very seriously. Prayer is key to being successful workman. Second Chronicles seven fourteen said, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal them. Martin Luther was not satisfied with the religious world into which he was born. The deep need for personal piety caused him to spend much time in prayer. The result of that agonizing prayer brought great reformation. John Wesley prayed and the worldwide Methodist movement started. James 5.16 said the effectual fervent prayer of righteous men availeth much. Prevailing prayer brings perpetual power. When Moses prayed, the sea opened up and became superhighway. When Abraham prayed, God gave him son when, humanly speaking, it was an impossibility. When Joshua prayed, mighty cities fell on this leadership. When David prayed, God helped him to slay giant Goliath. When Elijah prayed, he called down fire from heaven. When Daniel prayed, he was saved from lions. When Paul prayed, the prison door was shaking right off their hinges. When John Knox prayed, Queen Mary trembled. When George Mueller prayed, great orphanages were built and maintained. When Hannah prayed, God gave her son Samuel. When King Hezekiah prayed, God spared his life 15 more years. When Roberts prayed, the great revival swept across the country of Wales. Every miracle in the Bible is a result of a fervent prayer. Prayer does not need proof, it needs practice. Today we agonize, or we organize, instead of agonizing on our knees before God. Jesus spent much time in prayer before he entered his public ministry. Frequently he went off to pray long hours, sometime all night. If we are to know the secret power, we must have life of prayer and communion with God. 
I have used this illustration time after time. During the Korean War back in 1950-53, there's a fierce battle fought at the Heartbreak Ridge near the 38th parallel. We renamed, we renamed that ridge Heartbreak Ridge. It was the American war correspondent. The newspaper man was covering that war. He saw many hundreds American soldiers killed on that particular ridge. So he named that ridge Heartbreak Ridge. Decide the American Fox so they fired the bullet to enemy size, and the enemies Fox so they fire guns to the American soldier side. So they were exchanging the bullets back and forth. Fifty yards from the American foxhole into the enemy's territory, that one young American soldier was hit by the enemy bullet, left the shoulder. He lost too much blood. In their desperation, he cried for help. They could hear from the American foxhole, but nobody dared to face the enemy bullet and rescue that dying soldier safely back to the foxhole. One young man kept looking at his watch. When the nine o'clock struck, Without a saying a word, he crawled on his stomach 50 yards into the enemy's territory, rescued that dying soldier safely back to the foxhole. They gave him a first aid. Sergeant asked him a question. Why did you wait until 9 o'clock before you went enemy's territory, rescued that dying soldier safely back to the foxhole? Young man replied, Sarge, when I left home, my mother promised me she will pray for me every morning at 9 o'clock. I know I'd be safe from the enemy bullet if I went at 9 o'clock. <laughs> what the American new day, new need today is a generation of God-fearing mothers and fathers willing to kneel by the bedside, prayed all night. Their wandering sons and daughters come back to the full of God. If my people what you call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Again, Paul managers prayed without ceasing. The worker must be pure from idolatry. Exodus 20, verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We are surrounded by all kinds of idol worship, sorcery, and compromise. We compromise our conviction for convenience sake. Our culture habits and practice have overtaken the scripture mandate for holy living. Jesus said, be holy because I'm holy. The worker must be pure from immorality. First Corinthians 16, 13, 6, 13 said, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and Lord for the body. 90% of all Americans say they believe in God. 80% profess to be a Christian, yet families are spreading apart record numbers. Countless unborn babies have been killed. There are 100 times more burglaries in so-called Christian America than in so-called pagan Japan. Knowing not that your body a member of Christ. Worker must be pure from worldliness. 1 John 2, 15 said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of Father is not in him. Worker must have a commitment for the task that God has given to them. Psalm 37, 5 said, Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. Without strong commitment on our part, we cannot finish the task that God has entrusted to us. Paul certainly admonished us to make that commitment when he said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If we are to make solid commitment, there must be purpose in our heart. Daniel 1 8 said, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. John 12 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into ground and die, it abideth alone, but if he died, 
it bring forth much fruit. Unless we are willing to give our lives, we do not know the commitment and sacrifice that God is expecting from his workmen. Candle must be sacrificed itself to give a light. Coal must be consumed to furnish heat. Water must be heated 212 degrees to produce powerful steam. Grapes must be crushed to produce wine. Stuart Hamblin said, my greatest stumbling block has not been my old cronies out in the world, but the skeptical Christians who are waiting and watching for me to stumble. What kind of a commitment is needed to finish the task that God has instructed, instru entrusted to us? I'm concluding with this story, but it's no reflex upon Japanese student who may be here. Korea has been occupied by Japan since 1910 to 1945, until the end of the Second World War. During that period of time, we had to worship Japanese Shinto shrine. They said American missionaries are detriment to imperial regime of Japanese government, so they asked all the foreign missionaries to leave Korea. At one time, Japanese made all the Korean churches close the door of their church. This little country church is a Methodist by denomination. It's about 13 kilometers, about around seven, eight miles from where I live. This little Methodist church was tucked away by the rice paddy. Japanese chief of police told they cannot hold the service any longer, so they closed the church door for a number of months. One day, Japanese Chief of Police told Korean pastor he called the service coming Sunday morning. He didn't ask why or how come. He was overjoyed, so he invited the people. Some people walked five kilometers, 10 kilometers. And pastor got up, asked them to sing one of the Korean fav favorite hymn, Nail my God to thee, nail it to thee, even though it be a cross, nail my God to thee. Japanese police locked the door of that church from outside, threw the gall gallons of kerosene, and set the church on fire. Naturally, men would try to break the window and try to escape, but a squad of Japanese police is standing all around the church with the guns and ready to shoot if anyone would jump out. They all stay inside. They die. The story doesn't end there. Nineteen seventy three or four group of Japanese pastors came to Korea. They want to see where their forefathers burned the church down. Of course, Korean Christians made the monument, set up the stone, they engrave all the names of people who died on that Sunday morning fire. They were broken hearted. They went back to Japan. They raised the 10 million yen and brought and built a beautiful little church back. On last Sunday of September of that year, I was attending that dedication service. Church was packed. Korean delegation was over here. Japanese delegation's over here. Sermon was given. Dedicatory prayer was offered. The final hymn they were singing, well, as and then my Savior bleed, and then my servant died, would he devote the sacred head for such a woman as I? Japanese delegation stood up, walked over here where Korean delegation was sitting. They embraced one another. They hugged for one another. Japanese pastors asked them for forgiveness, and Korean pastors forgave them. That's the power of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ.